The miracle of the wedding feast challenges us to stay awake to God's particular vision for us, realizing each moment is filled with possibilities and that God is at work, work inviting us to be partners in divine creativity and wholeness each moment of the day. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now standing there, there were six stone jo uh, water jars for the Jewish rite of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. And the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it came from. Though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine after the guests had become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. This is the word of God, spoken for all people. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Bill. So, every moment, really, holds possibilities, invitations to engage our gifts as partners in God's divine creativity and dreaming. Earth as it is on heaven comes to mind, or in heaven. So consider these moments from today's story, specifically through the lens of Mary and Jesus and the servants. John's gospel, as Bill just read it to us, sets the scene for us. As countless wedding guests swirl obliviously around them and supplies begin to dwindle, the servants work hard to hide their growing panic. Just imagine what's coming here. The mother and me can easily imagine Mary quietly but urgently pulling her distracted son to a quiet place away from his friends and the gathered guests to whisper the shameful news into his ear. They have no wine. To give you some perspective on this, in the ancient world, wedding feasts lasted for days, and it was the host's responsibility to provide abundant food and drink for the duration of the festivities. To run out of wine early was a breach of hospitality that guests might conceivably remember for years, and the kind of miscalculation that could also cost the servants their jobs, or, or worse. <clears throat> All we know of Mary in this particular setting is that she's one wedding guest amongst many, who amid the celebration and the distraction and the frivolity happening around her, notices a need and then names it, recognizing the high likelihood of scandal and humiliation that could easily ensue if it's left unattended. Mary's gift in that moment, her nudge, her whisper, is the simple act of moving from just observing to meeting an expectation by taking an action. Mary notices and then speaks, but it's notice, noticeable that it's not just everyone. Someone else might have looked and said, oh, wait for it. Bad things are coming, they're running out of wine. But Mary chooses to speak quietly and directly to the one person who she, whose gifts she believes could rectify the situation, and no one else. She doesn't go to the host or anyone else, she goes to Jesus. There's no testing or telling or elbowing or whispering around the room that could create a potential for this to become more than it currently is. Nor is there whispering and waiting to see what will happen because right now, it would seem from John's telling that the person who is most aware of the concern beyond the servants is Mary. 
Having raised Jesus for 30 years from virgin birth to wise men to the temple teaching to prophecies and beyond, Mary knows who her son is and what he's capable of and trusts that he can meet the service and the need that she perceives. She is as certain of his ability and his generosity as she, as she is of the need herself, and so she persists, despite Jesus' initial reaction, which is this. Je Jesus hears Mary's concern and initially brushes her off, saying, What concern is that to you or me? My time has not yet come. Jesus' true identity isn't known to the masses yet, and he may be thinking that winemaking might not be his best first miracle. Or maybe he's simply there with his buddies and doesn't want to be interrupted. It really isn't his problem. Or maybe there's a timeline for what he has to do and when that only he and God know. Whatever the case, Mary continues to press the urgency of her noticing a need into Jesus' presence as if to say, there's a desperate problem right now, right here. So change your plans. Hasten the hour. Empathy first. Help these people. Mind you, she doesn't really know the details of how this might happen or pretend to. She simply communicates her long-standing trust in Jesus' loving and generous nature and lays the groundwork for what comes next with a simple direction to the servants. Do whatever he tells you. Jesus' turn to make a decision. And Jesus now responds to Mary as Mary believes that he will. Moving beyond not yet time and not my problem, he uses the gifts Mary knows are in him and begins by instructing the servants to first fill the jars and then draw some out and take it to the chief steward. Mind you, those six stone jars in John's Gospel are huge. John tells us that each holds 20 to 30 gallons of water. And there isn't any running water in the ancient world. Just filling them with water would have meant countless trips to the well. And the physical stamina and resolve to do that in any kind of timely fashion to meet this particular emergency. Now, convert that volume to wine, and we're talking 800 to 1,000 bottles, right, of wine, and more than a ton of grapes, grapes that would normally be needed to produce that volume of wine. Imagine six jars, 20 to 30 gallons each, filled to the brim with water, now transformed into the unexpected deliciousness of a well-aged, top-shelf wine, when there's no reason to think that could possibly Jesus instructs the servants, and they comply. These presumably strong young servants who, while everyone else around them was caught up in whatever was going on in the wedding party at that moment, engaged their gifts in the moment simply by acting on what Jesus asked them to do. Fill the jars with water, says Jesus, and they do. They didn't argue, we need wine, not water. They just filled the jar. Now draw some out, says Jesus, and instead of complaining, what's that going to do? They draw the water out. And then take it to the steward. And instead of pushing back with a, listen, Jesus, really, I I'm pretty sure I have a better idea than this. They do, and become participants in a miracle. The only ones to witness the whole of it besides Jesus and Mary. Imagine the change that would have happened in them, the hope, the possibility they must have felt in seeing something as extraordinary as this unfold and knowing they have a hand in the process, simply by contributing the gifts that they had in that moment. They lived into God's dream, which is Partly, I hope that we all take care of one another. If we step a little bit further, imagine what happens if each of us engages in this way. If we intentionally, intentionally follow Mary's path in this story, noticing and then speaking and 
asking and acting on the gifts God sets inside of us. The simplest, most straightforward things like loving and sharing and giving and serving, listening and learning, worshiping and praying. Love him, love her, love them. Share your money, your time, your particular gift, your ability with that child, that elder, with that family. Worship with this parish family. Pray at your desk, at your bedside, with your teenager, for your spouse, your partner, your parent, for the world. Notice and listen for what that noticing moves in you. And then do what Jesus would tell you to do with those gifts that you have to step more fully into God's dream for you and engage with others who are trying to dream with God as well. We may not know how to turn gallons of water into gallons of wine on the fly, but like Mary, we have the capacity to be present to what's happening around us to see that there's a need here, or everything is not okay, or we're in trouble, or whatever the equivalent to they have no wine might be. What God places in us in those moments lies in how and where we go from there, whether our next steps, large or small, live into our way and our comfort level with doing things, or if they live into God. Because, as inspired by Steve Carnes Holmes' meditation, Spiritual Gifts, this is the truth of it. The gifts that you have, your humor, your patience, your love of beauty, your trust, they aren't for you. They're for the common good. We are all one together. Jesus didn't turn water into wine by himself. There was a prompt from his mother in the arduous work and follow-through of the servants and on. Your gifts are whatever the Spirit moves in you, maybe a talent or an ability, or maybe just the way you show up in the world. They include what you might think of as weakness, your tears, your slower pace, your silence. The world needs those things, too. The community needs your gifts, needs all of who you are, not the pretend parts, the things you do to fit in or keep people from reacting or not. But the real you, the spirit alive in you in all manner of ways. So trust that God really does live in you. Notice and live into God. And just one more prayer, this time from Stephen Charleston. He would look at it this way, I don't know why it happens. My life moves along as it always does, light and shadow and an eternal dance. Nothing special seems to be happening. It's just this feeling that presents itself. Quietly, but clearly, I suddenly become aware that I am, like all people, a source for blessing. I become conscious of the spiritual energy that is in my heart, the love and compassion, and it is almost an overwhelming sensation of all I can do is act on the feeling and release the blessing where it belongs, when it belongs, out into the world. Out to whomever it is intended to go to. Out to others dancing in light and shadow right now. Out to you.